Thank you. So for those of you who don't know me, um, I'm Reed Bowman and I am, I guess I am now the Emeritus Director of Avian Ecology, or at least oh, started on Monday. <laughs> uh, so I gave this talk at the Association of Field Ornithology. Um, I will say that this is summarizing 28 years of work at the bombing range in a 12 minute talk with three major management strategies that we've employed that I'm gonna discuss each of which could be an hour long talk. So this is sort of a, a little bit of a summary, but I'm gonna talk about the effects of climate, fire and various management methods on the recovery of the red cockaded woodpecker population at Yvonne Park Air Force Range. So the red cockaded woodpecker is uh, native to the Southeast endemic to the Southern Pine ecosystem. And as a consequence, it's depending on fire to maintain that structure. It's the only North American woodpecker that excavates its cavities in living pine trees. And because these living pine trees produce sap, it takes an, a really extended period of time, sometimes years for a bird to excavate these cavities. And therefore they are the limiting resource for these birds. Um, they often have a bank of various cavities and various stages of construction so that when they need one, they can finish one off. Um, the resin barrier is both an, an impediment to making it, but it's also a barrier to predation because snakes can climb trees with bark relatively easy. So what the, what the birds do is they excavate little chips all around the tree and create this barrier of pine resin that snakes won't cross. So it's, it's both, uh, it's, it's quite a good niche for the bird to occupy. And in order to do this, it's dependent on old growth forest because if anybody's ever tried to cut longleaf pine, it's like cement. So the birds have to wait until these trees are old enough that they're infected with a fungal infection that softens the heartwood in the trees. And generally those trees are 80 to 120 years old before they're infected with that heartwood fungus. They are also cooperative breeders like the Florida scope jay. Their populations have declined. There's probably only about 5% of longleaf left of its historical distribution. The populations have also declined concordantly. And this is the remaining RCW populations. And you can see that they're highly fragmented, relatively small compared to the contiguous distribution that once existed. It was listed as endangered in 1970, mainly because of the loss of old grown old growth pine forest, but also because of fire suppression, which changed the overall structure of that system and fragmentation and the loss of connectivity. So the problems are actually relatively clear. We need to restore historic habitat structure by reintroducing fire. We need to increase the availability of cavities, both within uh, populations and among populations or at the population level. Um, and we need to increase connectivity because of that fragmentation and isolation. And so in the early 2000s, the, the, the Red Cockaded Woodpecker Recovery Team developed an integrated management strategy that was based both on these needs and on the natural history of the jays, and, oh, sorry, of the woodpeckers. Um, and that was prescribed fire. The birds required less than three years, preferably even more frequent than that. Cavity management, because old growth trees don't exist. This meant creating artificial cavities for the birds. And then translocation, actually moving birds from one population to another or within populations. So this is Avon Park Air Force Range where we've been doing this work. Uh, mostly the dark green is the habitat for RCWs, but not all of that is because you can see these little squares. Those tend to be North Florida slash pine plantations as opposed to long pine. Lots of habitat to work with. Um, our work has essentially followed the same model as our J project. So we've monitored pretty intensely since 1992. Every single bird is uniquely banded. We do censuses of those birds. We find all the nests and monitor them. So essentially, we are tracking all inputs into the population and exports to the population, with the exception of emigration, because there really is no place for these birds to go. The nearest population is quite a ways. Um, so we know all this stuff. The really important thing is that this is the only detailed demographic data for a small population. And it seems like at the bottom range over 30 years, we've had to justify the need to do that. And from a conservation perspective, mixing science and conservation, this has actually given us a seat at the table. 
So I was added to the to the Red Cockade Woodpecker Recovery Plan in the early 2000s because of these data. Um, and I was on the spe species special assessment team, which evaluated the status of, of RCWs. So a lot of times our science gives us a seat at a table, which helps in terms of the direct application of conservation. Um, and this is how the population has changed over the years. This is just the Avon Park population, and I'll discuss why that's relevant. Um, and you can see a lot of growth, but some, some transitions that were important. Our translocation started in 1998. Our artificial cavity construction started a year earlier than that. Um, and you can see right after translocations, we started to see some population increases. And then suddenly there's this big dip. And that was because of Hurricane Charlie, which was a direct hit on the population and took down a lot of trees and had outright. We actually exceeded our population goal, which is 40 groups in 2021 and we're up around 45 groups right now. So that's been a huge success story. So the questions for this project was how do individual management actions affect demographic performance of RCWs? And then how do those individual management activities actually affect the change in population growth from year to year, whether it went up or went down? So those are two different strategies and some of the demographic things obviously affect the population change over time. And then we also wanted to just, just touch on how climate might affect all of this. So um, the fire managed the bombing range has actually been, for, for RCWs, has been exemplary. Um, our, our time is about 1.4 years time since fire. Our fire return interval is a little bit longer, and that's because our, our time since fire has gotten better over the years. Um, so that's exactly what we wanted. We've installed 338 artificial cavities and 28 recruit, recruitment clusters, which are brand new territories for RCWs consisting entirely of artificial cavities. So we're able to place those in certain areas. And we've done, we've moved 99 birds, 54 of those that have come from other populations and 45 within Avon Park. And so the model parameters that we've done are a couple of different ones for fire, both at the territory scale and at the cluster, which is essentially just the, the set of cavity trees. Um, we've done uh, how many cavities we've installed, how many cavities per cluster, and how many recruitment clusters were installed for a given year, um, and translocations, how many intra-population, inter-population, and total translocations. So these are how we characterize our management. Um, we used um, GLM, general linear mixed models, for all cluster years. So we had 1,232 individual territories in, across all these years. And we looked at um, representative parameters for each of these different um, categories, such as survival, uh, productivity, group size, things like that. Um, and then we also looked at population growth. So obviously our, our, our sample size is much smaller, just 25. Here we use backwards elimination linear regression to look at how the management activities in the year before, or sometimes we used um, gaps to, to record how population growth changed in, in response to those management. So our first result is that um, the average time since fire at the, at the, the cluster level influenced uh, fledgling productivity. So as time since fire got longer, the birds fled fewer birds. Pretty well known, just confirms what we pretty much already knew. Um, and because the birds fledged more, that increased group size, and group size has an independent effect on fledging productivity as well. So it was sort of this sequence of things. Um, Fire uh, was important, but not as important as we always tend to think. So if we just took a simple approach to better illustrating how fire affected it. 85% of our cluster years had time since fires less than three, which is what we want. So we just compared those 85% to the 15% that had longer time since fire intervals. And you can see that there are significant effects both on survival and fledging productivity if you let that time since fire go longer than three years. It doesn't show up as important in our model because there's not a whole lot of variation. We are doing fire right there. So, and then this is the effects of um, adult populations uh, on, sorry, 
the effect of management on Lambda and the change in the total adult population over time. And we had a bunch of different variables. The final model, which it was relatively high R squared, 52% of the variation, consisted of our total number of translocations that, uh, that is up to that a given year, the number of artificial cavities per territory, and also the Southern Oscillation Index was significant in these. And show you how some of these affect. So artificial cavities increase group size by it, for increasing group size. They do that by increasing the number of fledglings. Group size further increases fledglings, and that leads to recruitment of adults, which is why lambda goes up with artificial cavities. Recruitment clusters are really important. Uh, 12 of 28 recruitment clusters were occupied. They increased the number of PBGs, but importantly, it changed the, dis the spatial distribution so that our nearest neighbor analysis showed that we decreased nearest neighbor, which means we increased the clustering in the population. And lots of previous work has showed that when you change that pattern, you in generally decrease the contagion risk. Um, this is the result of our translocation. 75% on average of the birds we moved eventually became breeders. Um, and a little bit of differences between intra and inter, but both were really critically important. This resulted in 75 birds that became breeders that might not otherwise, and 34% of those were from other populations. Translocation success was greatest within two years of recruitment clusters. So those things are synergistic. You create new clusters, translocate birds into it, and they succeed by occupying those. And the population growth was greatest in uh, La Nina conditions. However, we didn't see demographic parameters that were related to SOI. So that still requires a little bit of work in trying to understand that. Now, I said this is a result of management. We know this because Avon Park wasn't the only population we studied. There was another population at an adjacent site that was on private land. Initially, it had a bunch of RCWs, um, but it received no management and it had gone extinct by 2012. So, or extirpated. Um, but the bombing range population continued to grow. So, the conclusions are that. Everything depends on fire. None of these things we think would be successful without the right fire conditions. And translocation is really a, a key part of that. Cavity management can affect both demography and lambda. And it also allows us to change the spatial distribution of a population over time, which increases connectivity. And translocations facilitate rapid population growth and colonization. And these are consistent with results from previous work um, and show that the, the cavity, the management strategy we adopted has been incredibly effective at the bombing range. There's a ton of people who've worked on this, but I just particularly want to mention Emily Angel and Greg, who've been leads, Greg Thompson, who've been leads on this project over the years um, and have really done a tremendous amount of work. But we've had other leads in the past, like Donnie Schwalm and uh, Lauren Gilson and Dave Leonard, who led this for a long, long time. With that, I'll stop and maybe have time for a question. Um, maybe if those of you would like to ask Reid a question, we could go ahead and get the next talk going while okay. you're asking questions. So go ahead. Has anyone got a question that they could shout into a speaker? Yeah. Oh, come on. <laughs> Speak loudly. Um, how do you define old growth for us? So, I mean, in general, old growth is about 80 years and above. Um, and most of the most of the uh, the longleaf pine was harvested at Avon Park Air Force Range in the 20s and 30s. So um, artificial cavities, however, can be inserted into trees at a much younger age. And we're also doing drilled cavities where we actually drill a hole, um, drill a couple holes, one that way and then one that way. Um, and those actually are, are, are occupied at a lower rate, but the birds stay in them longer and they require less maintenance. So uh, our next speaker is online, um, Josh Daskin. Josh, I'll, allow, uh, I'll let you introduce yourself. Um, right. Good morning. Give us one minute, John. I just gotta see, I gotta get the birdies. Okay, Josh, you're good. 
Thank you. Off you go, Josh Symes. All right. Good morning. Uh, I'm Josh Daskin. I'm the director of conservation at Archbold, for those of you I don't know. And I'm going to spend my 10 or 15 minutes giving you an update on um, our, our uh, contributions to a really ambitious conservation project that's operating statewide. It's called the Florida Wildlife Corridor. And um, although our conservation program works both um, internally at Archbold, and many of you will have heard about our burgeoning conservation strategy, working on how we get our science directly to conservation implementation, uh, this is one of our more external approaches to conservation implementation. Um, I really liked what Reed just said about uh, the RCW science giving him a seat at the table with the conservation implementers, and I would say that um, our ability to have a seat at the table at this really ambitious statewide and really nationally leading conservation effort um, is entirely due to our conservation science over the years. So um, it will be no surprise to you that Florida is a popular place. Um, the graph on the left here shows U.S. Census population data for the state from 2010 to 2022, and we've grown quite a bit. Um, the most recent data that were released just last month show 1,136 people are added to the population of Florida every single day. That is roughly equivalent to adding one um, Miami to the state, one Miami's worth of people to the state every single year. So. Uh, there is obviously quite a bit of pressure on our natural and agricultural lands that provide uh, biodiversity and uh, biodiversity and ecosystem services to the state's natural lands and to the people who live here. Uh, the maps on the right come from a now 10-year-old report by the uh, Florida, by the Thousand Friends of Florida group and several UF collaborators, and they just did some landscape forecasts of where in the state was likely to be developed which you can see from the uh, sort of 2010 baseline in the top left to the uh, projection of all that extra red developed area in the top right, which would have pretty catastrophic effects for um, through fragmentation and loss of habitat for our wildlife and ecosystem services. There is the opportunity for a, a more um, constrained set of development if we plan correctly, uh, which is shown in the bottom right there from the uh, Thousand Friends of Florida, Florida 2070 report. And that um, broadly is what the Florida Wildlife Corridor is meant to do. Um, I actually like to think of it as a roadmap for where we can and should uh, develop and where we can and should not develop in the state of Florida. So this is a map of the Florida Wildlife Corridor. Many of you will have heard it's about 18 million acres, covers about 50% of the land of the state. And the dark green areas are the conserved areas. The light green areas are those what we call opportunity areas. They are not yet conserved. So. Um, Archbold is the primary conservation science partner in the campaign to conserve the corridor. And uh, we do this by building the evidence base for the corridor, by doing some conservation science and connectivity science, understanding what the benefits of conserving will be for various species and ecosystems. We recruit scientific partners and conservation implementation partners that, again, our uh, sort of decades of experience in Florida give us the opportunity to connect with and mean that we have the network to be able to bring these folks into the campaign. Uh, we also do quite a bit of communications work for the corridor campaign uh, through cartography and production of um, scientifically based images and sound files, uh, some of which Joe Guthrie will talk about, I think, later this afternoon. Um, so why Archbold? Well, I've already alluded, we're the, the primary conservation science partner in this campaign of dozens of statewide organizations working on the corridor because of our deep knowledge of Florida ecosystems, because we're a respected um, apolitical information provider um, and that helps secure, uh, we, we are glad to be this uh, large partner in the campaign because it helps secure the natural laboratories that our science depends on. So I'm gonna take you through a couple specific examples of how we've contributed in, in 2022, um, sort of a year in review. We hosted three of what we called uh, corridor science exchanges. These were online meetings that brought scientists from around the state and around the country actually together to discuss the challenges for corridor conservation. The first one was based around prioritization. So saying where in the corridor should be conserved first. The map on the right is one of several prioritization models that was produced in 2021 and 2022 with Archbold input. Um, and horizon one, two, and three indicate the sort of combination of areas that have the highest level of threat and the highest levels of biodiversity. So we should be working in those combined areas that have both high levels of threat, they're likely to be developed, 
relatively quickly and that are important to connectivity and biodiversity. Um, this prioritization uh, exchange led directly to a collaboration team, a working group that I've been vice chairing, uh, trying to get several prioritizations uh, out to partners like land trusts and agencies who can then go and use it on the ground to acquire or put easements on conservation on new conservation lands. Our second science exchange was around water resources and trying to define uh, some of the questions actually that we didn't have answers to yet for how water resources can benefit from corridor conservation because this is of course a wildlife project um, first and foremost and it's not necessarily clear that that would or where or how it would have water resources benefits. Um, so again we had several dozen uh, water resources and land conservation experts in the room. Um, and this is, again, something that we can do because we have this network from de decades of uh, working in Florida, bringing these people together who wouldn't necessarily otherwise be talking to each other about the overlaps between wildlife and water conservation. This one was particularly exciting because it was also the kickoff meeting for a uh, University of Florida Water Institute led and Archbold contracted report on how uh, on the same topics of how water resources um, will overlap and will not overlap with land conservation. So um, wildlife conservation and water conservation both get a lot of attention in Florida. And sometimes there can be a tendency for uh, to speak sort of loosely about how one will affect the other. We contracted the real experts and um, actually brought them into the corridor campaign. It wasn't something that they had really thought about previously. The expert panel is listed here on the right. These are the real top leaders in water, water science statewide and asked them to um, perform some GIS analyses to show us where in the corridor different water resources listed on the left here, water quantity and quality, water supply, springs, lakes, wetlands, rivers, estuaries, and imperiled species. Where do these resources actually overlap with the corridor effort and where do they not? So we'll be releasing this report in the next coming month the broad take home is that for a wildlife based project, there's actually a remarkable amount of overlap, um, although not for all types of resources. And so this gives us um, at Archbold and our partners at the Florida Wildlife Corridor Foundation, at Live Wildly, at Conservation Florida, and several other groups, uh, actually all groups statewide, it gives them the actual numbers to go and speak to legislators, to go and speak to other potential funders and say, here's where the benefits are going to accrue. Here's where you're going to need some other type of conservation work or regulatory work or some other program to conserve um, water resources values that actually are not covered by the wildlife corridor. And so this gives uh, reputability to the campaign. The third science exchange was in March and was around topics of resilience, climate change. Um, and we had folks thinking not only about um, climate change resilience for natural ecosystems, but especially for how um, movement inland of people, inland movement of people, uh, which is uh, likely to happen as sea level rises, how will that impact the ability to conserve what's largely an inland corridor in the peninsula of Florida? Uh, so we brought in Matthew Hauer, who's the leading sociologist on this topic from Florida State University to speak to um, the campaign partners and to source some actually questions that we need answering around how climate change and the corridor overlap. We're hopefully going to be kicking off a report similar to uh, the water report in 2023, uh, pending some new funding, uh, again, to answer those kinds of questions that were raised at the uh, science exchange. All three science exchanges led into the Florida Wildlife Corridor Summit, which was a major event hosted by the Corridor Foundation and Archbold and others in Orlando with 250 attendees and really built a lot of goodwill around the corridor campaign effort. Um, a few more uh, ways that Archbold is contributing to the effort to conserve the remaining 8 million acres of uh, opportunity lands. We are participating on several, uh, participating and leading several collaboration teams or working groups. I am vice chairing a group on payment for ecosystem services efforts. So how can we pay landowners to do better management uh, that serves biodiversity or helps provide ecosystem services while conserving lands? Uh, this group we recruited Eric Draper, the former um, CEO of Audubon Florida and the director of Florida State Parks to lead the group. Uh, Viv uh, Slaughter, our director of data and technology is vice chairing a group on how do we track, how do we use data and cartography to track the progress 
of conservation in the corridor. Uh, and I'm also vice chairing that prioritization group that I mentioned earlier, shared these data, uh, shared these mapping resources to a few dozen um, uh, land conservation organizations statewide. Because we're uh, the primary science partner, we're also trying to create new resources, uh, new database products to build the evidence base for why a corridor is necessary. Uh, Julie Sorfleet, uh, along with Angelique Meeks, put together a nice summary of national land cover data set, uh, which shows us that the conversion of natural lands to developed lands since 2004 has proceeded at a pace of about 25,000 uh, acres per year. Um, so this is pretty uh, fast level of conversion. Natural lands are also being converted to crops which are somewhat less um, uh, useful for biodiversity conservation than a ranch uh, like Buck Island. Um, and we're also producing uh, new connectivity models using new methods. Uh, the bottom three graphs, uh, three maps here show a model I built using circuit theory, which models the landscape uh, as if it were an electrical circuit and an animal moving were an electron uh, to try to determine where resistance occurs in the landscape uh, so I built this model really as sort of a, a, a case a case test or a test case to see if some of the older uh, sorts of connectivity modeling, particularly least cost path modeling that goes into the development of the geography of the corridor stands up and is um, sort of in line with what some newer methods that are um, more complex in how they consider the decisions an animal might make on the landscape. Um, and in fact, it reproduces a lot of the sort of salient properties of the corridor. Um, so you can see some of these blue areas, which are the best for connectivity. The Everglades, o Apalachicola and Ocala National Forests all show up. Um, so uh, I'll be uh, happy to talk more about that another time, but not really um, within the scope of, of the short time for today's talk. Um, we are also doing some communications work. I'm going to leave Joe to talk about his big corridor observatory later today. And then uh, Angeline has been leading the way on quite a bit of cartography-based communications. We're providing maps like the one on the right to key legislators to show them how the corridor touches their uh, parts of Florida. This one will be for uh, Paul Renner, the Speaker of the House, which we delivered um, to some partners doing legislative outreach just last week. Uh, and we're also trying to place science and the corridor uh, front and foremost for the public. For instance, through this op-ed I authored um, uh, about a month ago in the Orlando Sentinel. There have been quite a number of recent successes. I'll leave you to read a couple of quotes from leading legislators on the left who are putting the corridor front and center in their priorities for the upcoming legislative session, which begins in March. Uh, there's also been 36,000 acres conserved by the state of Florida within the corridor in 2022. We're hopeful that, will, that pace will accelerate in 2023. And everything I'm hearing out of Tallahassee is that there are very positive discussions for potential new funding and some creative ways that the corridor is touching conservation. So stay tuned for hopefully more good news in the coming months. Uh, the last thing I'll say is just that the corridor is possible because of lots of great um, activities that all of these partners have done over decades. Long before we called it corridor conservation, they were doing corridor conservation and that is why we have the opportunity for the most ambitious landscape connectivity project in the US, I would say. I will stop there. Thank you very much. If there's time for a question, I'll take one. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. And there is a minute or two for questions. Laura, if you would like to go ahead and change over for our next slide and read. I think you had a question. Shout really loud. Josh, I wonder if your connectivity models have taken into account the possible law of the citrus industry and the conversion of orange groves to suburbia. Thanks, Reed. Um, so the corridor mapping is originally done or is primarily done by the Florida Ecological Greenways Network, which does absolutely include current land use. Uh, I think that there is probably some more additional work that could be done on forecasting what we expect to have happen to some of these rapidly changing land use types like citrus. Um, you know what can we expect in 10 years time connectivity is going to look like if these places are developed. So I would say um, we don't have really a quantitative connectivity model using something like circuit theory or even least cost paths to say how the corridor is going to change, but we have got some uh, planning data coming in from the Central Florida Regional Planning Council uh, 
on which places are getting building permits pulled, uh, where are there utilities easements that allow somebody to build, um, where they're be able to get water or power. So we I would say we have um, you know the the basic information needed to do that work, but it hasn't been completed yet. And really, sort of a, a perspective forecasting approach. It's a good. It's a good idea. So I think I'll leave that at that. Josh, thank you very much for your talk. And Alia is the next speaker on. Over to you, Laura. All right, Aliyah, I'm just I'm trying to make the view a little bit better for the people over here, but I don't know if it's gonna yeah. All right, let's we're ready if you're ready. Okay, can you see the, the slides and not the notes? Yes. Okay. Yep. Hi everyone, my name is Aaliyah DeLong. I am a human dimensions postdoc and I work at the ranch with Betsy Boughton. And I am a postdoc on this project the um, within the long-term agroecosystem research network, which I will call LTAR. And I'm going to be talking about improving research products through stakeholder engagement. So a little bit about LTAR, it's comprised of 18 research sites uh, that have an average of 50 years history. And the purpose is to have sustained crop and livestock production and ecosystem service data. Oops, I'm on a timer. Um, and with that data, with long-term data, we can forecast and verify the effects of environmental trends in public policy and technology development. So the overall mission is to develop national strategies for sustainable intensification, which means increasing production while maintaining or decreasing system resources. Uh, this is, of course, balanced with conservation of natural resources, environmental protection, and enhanced rural well-being. And so uh, the site is a dual site. It's Buck Island Ranch as a part of Archibald and also the University of Florida at the Range Cattle Research and Education Center in Ona. And so what we do at each LTAR site is a common experiment. And between Buck Island and Ona, we have a, a common experiment across the land use gradient. And overall, uh, looking at um, how does innovative management affect cow calf production and multiple ecosystem services across a land use intensity gradient. Um, okay. And research across the different sites have common measurements uh, on multiple agroecosystems. That's why we call it the common experiment. So they're croplands, rangelands, and pasture lands with the goal of developing new technology to address both local and national challenges and opportunities. And so this means we're looking at a business as usual management, which is kind of the industry standard for the area versus an aspirational treatment, which looks at a strategy for sustainable intensification while document, do, documenting the trade-offs between the two. And so today on the right, you can see uh, some of the goals of the LTAR project. And I'm going to be talking about uh, the green box engaging stakeholders in research and technology development. So this is the network level stakeholder engagement strategy. Um, at the center is engaging stakeholders and partners. And so our goal is to have relevant research that has stakeholder informed research questions and priorities. Then uh, share and publish means making data and tools freely accessible to stakeholders. We want to produce tools that are useful, usable, and used. And that means engaging uh, stakeholders at all phases of development. 
uh, translate and communicate means we want to make the our research available and understandable to increase knowledge development, adoption, and upscaling. So why stakeholder engagement? Essentially, different kinds of expertise means you have a more informed research project and a more rigorous research project. Uh, you get knowledge from multiple sources of experts, and that means the experiential knowledge of farmers and ranchers combined with the theoretical and analytical knowledge from scientists and researchers. So that's kind of like expanding your research team to have more types of experts. And so one way that we're doing this at the Archbold UF site is by having an advisory council, which are hand selected experts in their fields. So ranchers are experts in production, technical advisors are experts um, in terms of providing for the ranchers in their area. Same with other state agencies and then also nonprofits like the Nature Conservancy, which have expertise in conservation. So at the center of uh, the advisory council is the co-production of knowledge, which is what I described earlier, with, which is creating new knowledge as a group and an expanded research team. So the co meaning collaborative together. And here are just some ways that we are doing this or will do that. Um, we have guidance for the project overall from our advisory council. Um, and going back to the network level model, we want an output to be usable and useful innovative tools. Um, we'll be able to develop an outreach strategy with our stakeholders to ensure that it is reaching the, the audiences that we want it to reach. And then we also want to leave it up to the advisory council to have some say in how they would like uh, to be involved in our project um, as they see fit. Um, so here is a, a general list of the types of activities we would do for stakeholder in, a stakeholder engagement strategy. Um, again, co-developing research, and this might involve conducting a research assessment where producers review previous research science uh, at Archibald UF and determine areas of strength and maybe areas that need improvement. Um, our advisory councils will help technology adoption, like rate of adoption and adoption rate, since it is informed by the stakeholders. Um, and like I mentioned, an outreach plan and determining the direction of future meetings. And so I'm going to blast through an example. <laughs> So this is called the nominal group technique, which is a problem solving and solution identifying method that involves generating ideas, independently recording ideas, discussing ideas as a group, and then ranking them. And we use this method to determine research priorities. Uh, so we, pre we presented our common experiment treatments and measurements to our advisory council, providing information only. And then each of the stakeholders independently uh, answered the following questions, most and least useful treatments and measurements, and also what is missing and why. And so then each person gets a chance to answer their question, which we go one, one at a time. Um, and then as a group, participants select the top ideas from the brainstorming that they believe should be research priorities. And then collectively come to a consensus um, about ideas that become, you know, research priorities as we design aspirational treatments for a common experiment. So this is just briefly what it would look like. The most useful aspects of our research project as identified by the stakeholders. Um, least useful in missing pieces. So this is just an example. I'm not going to go through it. I won't have time for that today. Uh, but then we use the responses from all of these questions to determine research priorities, um, where each person has a chance to select their top two research priorities. And as you can see, the, what we ended up with was, you know, needing economic data and in specific circumstances in prioritizing climate smart agriculture with also 
uh, specific suggestions. So what we come out with is valid social science data that informs our future research because stakeholder engagement has been happening in an informal way for you know how extensive amount, amounts of time um, including at Archibald and the University of Florida site so what we're doing is we're taking that and making it into a formalized process and really doing social science through stakeholder engagement um, that makes our research more rigorous and more applicable to the end users. And so in this image, we've achieved, we've, um, yeah, achieved step one, where we identified research priorities. And so the next steps moving forward will be the research team looking at aspirational treatments that are feasible within our resources. And then again, we'll come together and researchers and stakeholders in our, our advisory council to come to a consensus about which of the relevant aspirational treatments should we proceed with based on the research priorities that we established. And so what we anticipate are stakeholder design outreach products and we will have research products that were not only developed with ranchers in mind, but also co-designed with ranchers. Uh, we would be able to rule out treatments that don't work by expediting the process by having the research priorities co-developed with all of the groups. And formalized evidence to support stakeholder engagement strategies and evidence for uh, grant applications that there is valid data to support uh, your proposal. And so that was the quick and dirty uh, version of what we're doing at the Archibald UF LTAR site. And if you want to learn more about LTAR, I put their website here. And um, since we have a limited amount of time today, uh, I wanted to put my email and phone number um, because I'm happy to chat with folks um, about my research. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, um, Aaliyah. And she's left some time for questions here. So let's take advantage of them. Um, are there any from the floor? I think there's some interesting implications for those of us who are doing other work in other areas, not just those in agricultural areas. And um, so did anyone have a question for Aaliyah? Go ahead, loud as you can, Andrew. Aaliyah, how do you identify which stakeholders to include in those initial meetings? Um, so when you think about looking for experts to add to a research team, um, if you're doing research on soil, you wanna invite a soil scientist because they're an expert in that area. So. Um, we are not aiming to have a representative research, um, or I mean, a representative advisory council, but we want to invite experts in their area to add to the research team. Um, any other questions? I have one for you. So, um, we don't have one in the chat, Laura, is that correct? I have one for you um, since we've got a minute uh, or so. Uh, before we load up the next talk. Could you tell folks how you're actually linking our work with other LTOR sites so that it's part of the network? Yes, so stakeholder engagement is going to, is a big part of the LTOR network as a whole. And we just had a workshop last week. Um, I'm part of the Human Dimensions Working Group that's a part of LTAR. And what we want to do is create a toolkit for all 18 sites to use so that they have a common protocol to follow. And we can look at stakeholder engagement that's done in a formalized process across all the sites. And since it's um, kind of a context specific um, process, because we're looking at um, 
a certain geographic area in production system, um, we'll be able to get a bigger picture of what stakeholders across the 18 sites um, are looking for um, because you know research priorities in general are more broad than an aspirational treatment. So we'll get a, a better picture of research priorities across the network. Okay, so thank you, Alia. And we'll have our next speaker. I think it's Serling, is that right? Uh, would you like to come up and get your talk ready? Thanks. Yeah, I think you're Yeah, where I can see this video. Well, basically, we want to here. Actually, right now. If it doesn't, just click on the screen again and make it. Okay, thanks, Laura. <laughs> All right, so good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Sterling. I'm an RA in the plant lab, and I'm excited to tell you. Uh, about something that's not a plant, it's a lichen, an endangered lichen that we have right here on station known as Cladonia perforata. Um, and so a lot of RAs have worked on this over the years. So Haley Dole, Catherine Charton, Stephanie Kuntz, Sarah Hollercrate, Stacey Smith, Scott Ward, and of course the program directors, Eric Menges and Aaron David. Um, so of course we know that Archbold is located at the southern end of the Lake Wales Ridge. And one of the main ecosystems we focus on is the rosemary scrub um, or rosemary bulbs, which of course have these um, ericaceous shrubs. And you often see these white sand gaps in between them where we see a lot of herbaceous plant endemics that we study. But one of the other organisms that grows there are lichens. Many of them are in this genus Cladonia, and many of them are terrestrial or ground lichens. So a little bit about these lichens. Um, they're a composite organism consisting of both a fungus and a green algae. Um, and so in this case, it's an ascomycete fungus. And so we really have quite a diversity of these fungi growing um, in these bulbs and all over the Lake Wales Ridge. There's probably a dozen or more species of Cladonia. And a lot of them, like the ones we see in this picture, simply grow on bare substrate, often bare sand, um, and aren't really anchored to anything. And so they kind of just sit there <clears throat> and you'll see a lot of these commonly you'll see cladonia subtenuous or vanzii these are the more poofy looking ones that you can see in large colonies in leparina or the jester lichen um, but then of course our endangered one is this one right here cladonia perforata in the middle so a closer look at that once you kind of get to know it and look closely at it, it does have a pretty unique um, morphology so the cortex or the skin is pretty glossy and kind of um, smooth and generally has a whitish to yellowish green coloring. And of course, as the name suggests, it has these perforations at each of the branching points. And you can kind of see it either as individual fragments lying on the sands like here, or if it's in a, a healthy place in large colonies like you see here. And this is just the up close picture of Cladonia perforata on the right and Leparina on the left. And so these two often get confused with each other, especially if Leparina doesn't have these red fruiting bodies, they can look a little similar. But if you see it, Perforati can see is a little bit thicker and has kind of a lighter green color. So if you do see it up there, we would love to know it. So a little bit about the conservation of this species. It is one of just two federally listed lichen species in the United States. Um, there probably should be more listed, but it's one of the two that made it on the list. And we know now that there are at least four disjunct metapopulations across Florida where it's, um, where it's endemic. So one of those is in the Panhandle in the North Gulf Coast where it was first discovered. And also in the Atlantic Coastal Ridge in Manatee County, 
and of course in the Lake Wales Ridge where most of the known populations occur. And it specializes on the rosemary scrub ecosystem in particular um, in bare sand patches um, where it gets plenty of sunlight. And so likewise, it's threatened by fire suppression um, where it's losing these bare sand patches and of course development of the Lake Wales Ridge. So it does have unique conservation challenges as a lichen. <clears throat> it has no known sexual reproduction or ceridia, which are asexual spores that lichens produce. So it basically relies entirely on phallus fragmentation or vegetative fragmentation and being dispersed about the habitat in that manner. And so as a lichen, it grows very slowly and growth of population can take years, you know, decades to occur. And of course, on the ridge, fire is extremely important. And this lichen has somewhat of a fire paradox in that it needs the fire to create an open habitat, but lichens are extremely sensitive to fire. They can't withstand direct fire. And really intense fires like the one here would probably um, nearly demolish the population. So some of the main questions we're asking with this study uh, are what are the long-term population trends of Cladonia perforata? And likewise, how does it respond to fire? And based on that, what are the ideal fire management strategies for this species? So we've studied the species since 2009. Um, seven of our sites are at Archibald Biological Station at various bulbs. And then two of the sites are located at the Royce Unit on the Lake Wales Ridge Wildlife and Environmental Area. So it is very slow growing. So we monitor each of these sites every three years and remap them using GPS every six years. And then we resample anytime there is a fire. And we also check extirpated sites because in some cases um, we found one to come back or we found fragments of the lichen after 18 years of not seeing it before. So it can be kind of hidden in the environment. So looking into our methods, um, we start out by mapping the known lichen population um, using a GPS and putting a 10 meter buffer around that population. And then creating a grid cell, we put three points per 20 meter grid cell to establish um, monitoring plots. So first we establish presence absence plots where we simply check for the lichen within a 1.5 meter radius. And then within a subset of those plots, we establish smaller cover plots where we look at um, kind of a micro scale of a point intercept, what the cover of the lichen is looking like at that point. So we're trying to look at multiple spatial, spatial scales of this lichen. And we also have taken data on microhabitat, including canopy coverage and the dominant ground cover. So just to get into a little bit of the preliminary data that we've collected, um, I'll first start out by looking at some of the bulbs that have been burned at Archbold and looking at the long-term trends with those. So on the left graph, we can see the presence absence plots, and this is the proportion of the plots that are occupied. And then on the x-axis is the year. And on the right is percent lichen cover that we see with those lichen boards. And then those vertical lines are looking at the dates of the fires that have occurred. So if we look at, um, for instance, this red population on the left, we can see that after this fire in 2010, um, there was a substantial decrease in that population um, in terms of the uh, proportion of occupied plots. And then in 2020, there was another fire that affected all of these bulbs. Um, and you can see in most cases, they did decrease, um, but except for the purple population, which didn't see a substantial change. Um, but if we look at the percent that was burned, it somewhat explains this pattern um, as the purple population did not have as many of the plots that had actually burned, whereas the green population um, had had 90% of the plots burned and we saw a pretty substantial drop. And then with percent lichen cover, um, we see somewhat similar trends in terms of drops post fire after the 2020 fire. Um, but in some cases, it's not as consistent. For instance, you see the red population does not um, have a substantial drop. And in fact, it had some of an increase, um, although it's highly, it can be a little variable. And then looking at burn, unburned populations at Archibald to see what happens when there is no burn management um, at these particular sites. Uh, we can see that they tend to remain a little bit more stable, but there is some fluctuations that's kind of random um, across these three bulbs that we looked at. There's going to be some up and down in response to various factors, but there's not a consistent trend um, 
And then we see kind of a various patterns looking at percent lichen cover as well, um, but nothing super consistent, but it might have a tendency to decrease over time, if anything. And then looking at the Royce unit um, at Lake Wales Ridge, we have these red marks are again marking the point of the burn. So again, looking at the left plot in proportion of plots burned, we do see that there is um, substantial decreases um, and looking at, in this case, 100% of the lichen plots were burned. Um, and then in the blue population, we see there was also a decrease, so not as substantial. Um, and it does start to recover after the burn, although it takes many years. And we see in the case of the percent lichen cover on a more micro scale, it might be more affected. So in the case of the red population, um, it was reduced to actually like zero and it hasn't um, jumped back yet the blue population was not quite as affected. And lastly, this figure is just looking at kind of long-term um, changes in the lichen. So this is from the initial sampling point to the most recent sampling point with the years giving the number of years that it has been monitored and then fire representing the ones that have been burned. So looking at this, there isn't a huge trend versus un versus unburned versus burned, um, but we do see that in general, they tend to decrease in percent lichen cover but not in every case. And so the lichen can increase. And so that is encouraging. So just some basic conclusions from this. <clears throat> we do see that Plutonia perforata populations are relatively stable, but they do have a tendency to decrease. And a lot of this has to do with fire management. And so we see that they are pretty sensitive to fire and have a slow recovery rate. And likewise, fire really should be applied carefully, particularly uh, considering these slow growing lichens that have really no way of restoring their populations via a seed bank or roots or anything like that. And so particularly sensitive populations, we may want to take extra measures such as temporary removal of the lichens, which has been done before uh, with some success. And so it's fairly easy to simply remove them from the population and return them. And like many species, somewhat frequent patchy fires are often, often preferred to create a mosaic habitat where it can have these unburned refugia um, where it can recolonize from. And so just a few uh, areas where we could definitely take this study, um, looking at more precise measures of burn intensity and spatial patterns of those burns across the bulb, and also doing digital scanning of lichen cover. Um, so not just doing the cover board, maybe using drones, who knows? And we're also interested in looking at modes of dispersal across the habitat, since this is not well known. Is it being dispersed by any kind of animal or is it mostly abiotic dispersal? And in terms of the uh, conservation of this species, um, it is fortunately pretty easy to just move the lichen from one place to another. And so um, it's been successfully done where it's been taken from an unprotected site and put into a protected site, for example, in Jupiter, Florida. There's a lot of people to thank for this who have worked on this over the years. Um, of course, our current staff, Aaron, Hannah, and Andy, who are giving talks today, and all of our interns, Jeffrey, Tony, Iris, and Layla. And Iris is giving a talk this Thursday, so plug for that. And um, there have been many people who have worked on this project over the years, including Rebecca Yar, who has kind of got this project with Cladoni off the ground in the beginning. And we want to thank the Division of Plant Industry for our funding. With that, I will take any questions. There's none. <laughs> So other questions for Sterling? Go ahead, Sahas. Yeah. So um, what about the lichens that share the habitat with the building for product? Are they showing similar traits or? Um, yeah, I think they're not as as sensitive. I mean, they are all sensitive to fire, but I don't know if we've looked necessarily at how they are also responding, but that's a good idea. In some populations, we have looked at whether or not they're co-occurring, but it would be interesting to see that. In general, most of the lichens are very sensitive to fire. So. Yep. Thanks. Um, um, after that, you. Do you know what the microsite conditions that it prefers are, like the amount of sun, the amount of soil moisture? Um, I don't know about the amount of soil moisture, but I definitely it prefers full sun. Um, I need to look into the data on that a little more, but um, just to do as much photosynthesis as possible. I think it prefers open sun sites. Yep. So uh, go ahead. 
Sterling, can you tell the age of most of the plots you've been studying? How, what do you know about the timeline? Um, I mean, a lot of the plots have been there for a decade or around that. And so a lot of the lichens have also been there for that time. Um, and so it's, uh, yeah, really interesting to see like the lichens have been there for this entire period and growing over that time. And the lichens themselves, I'm sure, can be decades at least. I'm old. sure some of them go back to Becky Yards. Yeah, definitely. Laura, you have one on the chat that you could read it out. Yeah, we have a question from Fitz online. How does C. perforata respond to translocation into unoccupied rosemary balls? That's a good question. Um, I haven't personally done any work with that, but I know that um, it's been removed and put back into the same bulb and it's responded well. Um, but I don't know about previously unoccupied rosemary bulbs. I don't know that that's been done yet. Okay, we yeah. have one more online. This is from Eric Magus. He says, nice talk, Sterling. Are you finding patterns of change in microhabitats over time? that relate to changes in occupancy or cover. So I'm going to ask you to answer this in 30 seconds and get the <laughs> next speaker going in the meantime. So uh, go ahead. That's Laura. a good question. And the answer is I haven't quite looked at that yet, um, but I definitely think there would be changes in canopy cover and microhabitat looking at dominant ground cover. So I think that's the next step. Thanks. So thank you, Sterling. Thanks. And over to you, Meredith. Okay. Thanks, Laura. Um, so I'm a research assistant in the Avian Ecology Program, and I recently graduated with my master's from Florida Gulf Coast University. So what I'm presenting on today is just a sneak peek of what I did for my thesis. So first, I'd like to thank my committee members, Dr. Reed Bowman here at Archbold, and Dr. Lefebvre and Dr. Pavard from FGCU um, Archbold for being the host to my research and my home for the last five years, um, especially the GIS and data management lab, Viv and Julie specifically for helping me interpret the drone data and with the maps, and then various funding sources through FGCU, AFO, and Wilson Society. So you probably are pretty familiar with Florida scrub jays. Um, so I'll just give you some quick notes about why they're a good study species for habitat use studies. They're non-migratory and they don't move very far when they do disperse. They defend territories year round. And as habitat specialists, this means that the habitat that they have within their territories is really important to them. Um, since we've been observing scrub jays here for over 50 years, they're pretty easily acclimated to humans. So they're easy to follow around without being disturbed. So habitat structure is important to a wide variety of taxa. For birds specifically, it helps drive species diversity, reproductive success, it might influence where they put their nests, um, it influences bird movement and foraging behavior, and also their ability to see and hide from predators. And it's been suggested that the physical structure of plants is more important than the number of different species. And we know that human and natural disturbances can create this variation within habitats. For this study specifically looking at how fire can create variation within scrub jay territories. So previous ways of measuring structure manually is usually on a plot base or transect base. So it's limited in the amount of area you can cover. And then you have to extrapolate this data to a larger landscape, which it leaves more room for error. It also just takes a lot of time and effort. Whereas drones are becoming very popular in ecology, um, there's many uses for drones, such as mapping marine mammals, um, censusing large mammals in Africa, even going underwater, mapping coral reefs. So, but drones are becoming a lot more popular for mapping vegetation and structure. They can increase the amount of area you can monitor. Um, they increase your accessibility to remote areas or areas with difficult terrain. They increase the amount of area covered and they come with a lot of different sensors and cameras. 
all while reducing costs and the time spent in the field and disturbance to possible sensitive areas. Florida is the wildlife capital of the US. So historically, these wildfires lit by lightning um, would burn on a very large landscape, creating variation in structure at a large scale. But as urban development occurs, um, we also reduce or increase fire suppression. So now land managers are forced to create this variation in structure on a much smaller scale, such as within the boundaries of Archibald. So scrub jays, um, you've probably seen this graph before. This is from Fitzpatrick and Bowman. Um, they prefer an optical window between like two and 10 years post fire. So this is when that structure has grown up a little bit from fire. The acorns are being produced on the oaks. So this is what we consider optimal. And they have these increased survival and reproductive success within this time frame. And as you can see, after about 10 years, um, the habitat starts to become overgrown and they start to abandon. And then at 20 years, they've completely left that area. So the idea is that jays on larger territories after a fire comes through will still maintain some of this optimal habitat and therefore benefit from these increased reproductive success. And then jays on smaller territories are more likely to burn completely in a fire event, leaving them with very little resources. So Archibald does prescribe burning, um, usually using time since fire or fire return interval. So those fire metrics as like a surrogate for describing the structure after a fire, um, rather than collecting actual data about that structure. So my research objectives for the study were to test the gator eye lidar and Florida scrub within these J territories, and to understand the links between fire, habitat structure, and habitat use by Js. My questions, um, first, how does fire explain variation in habitat structure within J territories? predicting that more fires and fire patches will lead to higher structural diversity, and that this diversity may correlate with time since fire or fire return intervals, those fire metrics that Archibald typically collects. Does increased territory size provide more suitable habitat, thinking that larger territories will have more fire patches, which will lead to greater structural variation? And does post-fire habitat structure influence these behavior activities for jays? thinking that jays will prefer medium vegetation, avoid tall and low, but they might use these tall and low vegetation for other behaviors. So we collaborated with University of Florida on the Gator Eye drone developed by Dr. Broadbent and um, Dr. Zambrano. So this drone is really, really cool and it has all these different sorts of sensors. Um, we just focused on LiDAR this time, but in just one quick flight, it can capture a suite of more than 50 different ecological metrics. So we just focused on the 3D LIDAR imagery that it captured, and we collected this structure data at submeter scale for 29J territories, which then we aggregated to calculate a mean canopy height at a 30 meter resolution. So this is the output that the drone gave. So the black lines are the J territories, and then each grid cell is that 30 meter scale um, that I then classified as low, medium, and tall structure based on the canopy height that the drone data provided. And that is, um, here's some depictions on what that might look like out in the scrub. And then did a Shannon diversity index to kind of just give one value of structural diversity per territory. So for example, um, a homogenous landscape would be that 0.02. So you can see that it's pretty much all low. And then a higher index would be more diverse, so more heterogeneous. Um, it has some low, some medium, and some tall. So to find out how Jays are using this behavior, I followed them around for a long time. So I did one hour vocal watches on breeder males, um, recording everything that they were doing. So I used this really fancy timer app while simultaneously collecting a location point. So if the J went down to forage, I could click the foraging button over here and it would start a timer while also taking a time stamp. And then I would drop a, a pin over here, which would come up with a drop down menu that I could then record what behavior that was. Then I can link those two together 
overlay them on the drone map. Then I was able to classify what structure category each behavior was being conducted in. And as you can see here, they spend most of their time doing the forage and sentinel behaviors. So these are the two that I'm gonna focus on later on. And these are the fire metrics that we used for our analysis that um, Archibald has collected. So these first two time since fire and fire patches are just the most recent fires and they don't include overlap. And then number of fires and fire return interval takes into account the entire fire history of that area. So to look at the relationship between fire and structural diversity, um, we found no significant relationship with between any of these fire metrics. And then looking at territory size in fire, as territories get larger, they do experience a higher number of fires, as well as more fire patches. So you would think that this would lead to higher structural diversity within a larger territory, but as you can see here, that is not the case. So this is a good example of why defining a J territory as like a time since fire or a fire unit isn't always accurate to describe what the physical structure is looking like after a fire comes through. So to look at how the Jays use this habitat, um, we have what they have available and what they used. And you can see that they have low and medium is a lot more available and they use it a lot more, but these graphs are on the same scale. So you can see that they are using tall a little bit more than they have available. And these letters, um, if they have the same letter, they are not statistically different from one another. And if they have a different letter, they are significantly different, which you'll see on my further graphs as well. So to see if they had selection preferences or avoidances, I ran a manly resource selection. So the thick line at the one means that they have no preference or avoidance. Um, the lines above, the, so these points above the line mean that they select for that habitat and then below means they are avoiding it. So you can see overall um, combined data, they do prefer this medium and tall habitat and they're um, avoiding the low. Um, you can see, so there was a stronger selection for medium because the tall has these large confidence intervals. So there are some times where they are trying to avoid the tall as well. So then to break it down by those behaviors that they spend 90% of their time doing. Um, so on Sentinel, they are selecting for medium and tall, um, which does make sense because if you're on Sentinel, that means you're trying to scan for predators or other Jays that are coming into your territory. So they want to be up high. And for foraging, they are selecting for this medium and avoiding the low and tall. So in summary, um, FIRE did not influence measures of structural diversity in the way that we chose to measure diversity in this study. Territory size mattered for FIRE metrics, but not for the amount of diversity. And Jays do select this medium structure for foraging and tall for sentinel, overall using medium more, but they're selecting tall at a higher rate. And the drone was a quick way to measure and describe structure for land management decisions. So the overall conservation implications for this study, the Jays are going to consistently be reliant on conservation management um, because of more development and more fragmented habitat. They require us to kind of help create these fires to give them the structure that they need. So we can consider an average Jay territory size and um, those structures that we know that they prefer to use when, when planning prescribed fires. So we can attempt to try to create more patchy fires and not to burn an entire landscape so intensely that you leave homogeneously low um, structure for the Jays so that hopefully within the Jay territory, they can still retain some of those medium or taller structures that they need um, to perform those two behaviors that take up most of their time. And the drone that we use, the LIDAR data um, and the Gator I specifically can collect a large number of metrics that can be applied to other studies. So in just one flight, uh, we just focused on canopy height, but there's a number of other things that it looked like that other labs could potentially use as well.
folks. So I'm happy to take questions. We have a few minutes. Could you? So we've got a couple of minutes for questions for Meredith before we have a break. So um, open to the floor or to the zoo. Kevin. What was the uh, cell size on the structure data? It was 30 meter grid cell. So okay. we would like to look at it on a much finer scale as well. And how about the data that you were collecting, the point data? Uh, that was on a 10 meter buffer. Could I ask a follow up? That's not yeah. the actual LIDAR data on the 30 meter. Right? No, so the LIDAR can capture it at sub meter scale, but for processing time, um, since I was restricted, you know, I'm trying to graduate at some point, we had to figure out um, 30 meters was feasible to, to process. And then I just wanted the other programs to know that if you need finer scale, yes, you can get a bend in the data. Yeah, yeah, and that is something that would be beneficial to look at further down the line. So other question, but, but, um, I might have missed it, but did any of your fire uh, metrics affect the low, medium, and high structure? Yeah. Um, I didn't look at it specifically on that level. Okay. I just looked at it like broadly as the diversity that I created within a territory, but not specifically. It looked like yeah. the majority of the territories had a lot of low mm -hmm. in it. And so I just wondered, what does that tell us? Does that tell us anything about our fire? Yeah, well, this is another reason why looking at this on a smaller scale would be beneficial because with the 30 meter scale, we aren't really able to look at like a finer scale of how the jays are using it. So you could have a bunch of low, scrub and then like a few tall pines that might then drive that grid classification to medium. So at that point, we'll thank you again, Meredith, and also thank all of the speakers. So. Um...